Back before me and Olsen were partners, I was with this guy, Man. He was a weird son of a bitch, but he was, he was good at his job. He's on about a decade longer than me. He taught me quite a bit, matter of fact. He's the one that told me that there would be times when I wouldn't be able to solve the case. Said it wouldn't be because of me or a lack of skill or anything like that. It wouldn't be the evidence. It wouldn't be the witness. That there'd be times when... How'd he put it? You'd have all the pieces of the puzzle. You know, what the puzzle should look like, but for a reason you don't know and you can't understand. They just won't fit. And back in the late 80s, we drew a suspected homicide at this apartment building. Real pile of crap. Neighbors had complained about a smell coming from one of the units, so some officers went to check it out and ended up, we'd get the call. The girl was found wrapped completely in dental floss. I mean, each of her fingers and toes were individually wrapped, as were each of her limbs and her torso and her ears and the rest of her head, and then another layer went over everything. Was wrapped so none of her skin was visible. Could you imagine that? How long that must have taken? There were no weave patterns either. They were just wrapped, and continued with each new wrap around, touching the one before. How much floss do you think that took? Hundreds of rolls, if not more. Thousands, maybe. Never seen anything like it. But then, it was just that one time. Anyway, they identified the girl. Seventeen years old she was, from a couple states over. Now, if I remember right, her name was, uh, what was it? Kelly, that's it. Now, the guy who lives in the apartment hadn't been seen around the building for a couple of days, and we talked to the neighbors, people that lived on the same floor, a few others. Um, apparently, this guy, his name was Lucas, he kept to himself. He went to talk with the neighbors. Now, none of them knew his name, a few of them, they'd go, oh, you mean that guy from, um, Whatever unit he was in, um, 512, I think, whatever it was. Guy, that guy's an asshole. Something to that effect. Never to talk to anybody, never nodded in the halls, nothing. He lived in the building six years, but for about the last year, ten months or so, he'd been gone. Nobody's seen him. His rent was paid by check through the mail. He had his mail forwarded to a P.O. box. So the scene, um, his apartment was dark. We'd shown up there in the morning about 9 a.m. at his apartment made it feel like it was midnight. He painted the windows black, same with the walls. But on the walls were, um, you know, those um, cliche ransom letters. Where all the words are made up of different letters cut out of magazines. It was that, but over every inch of every black wall in this place. Messages were uh, disturbing. I don't remember what it was, um... Not at all verbatim, but they were just these long sorts of vague confessions. It's almost the end. It's coming for me. Please stop. That type of stuff. It was a two-bedroom apartment, and floor to ceiling, wall to wall, it was hundreds, thousands. Magazine letters making words that formed this guy's pleas for help. Fingerprint folks came in. They did their best. And like I said, this guy lived alone, never had a noise complaint, and... No one ever saw him with anyone else. Neighbors in the next units over, across the hall, never heard a peep from his apartment. Not, not even a TV or radio, but somehow, there were no less than, what was it, 90 some odd different fingerprints all over his house. And weirder than that is that all the fingerprints were all carefully placed. Like, one person went up to the table, the wall, refrigerator, door, whatever, placed their thumb down. Then another person came up, placed their finger down so on and so forth. The entire apartment, every surface, had these fingerprints intricately placed, evenly spaced. They found out that the only ones that they identified, there were two sets of fingerprints, one belonging to Lucas, another to a woman who had died in West Virginia in the early 60s, a few years before he was born. So the girl that was found dead in the apartment, she had no connection to Lucas, anyone, anyone we could find. She has absolutely no fingerprints on her. But it didn't look like anyone had intentionally wiped her down. They said she'd been dead about a week. And the cause of her death was, get this, suffocation by dental floss. In the course of her autopsy, they found that a few of her organs were also wrapped in dental floss, the same way her body was. Her heart, her liver, her lung, her kidney, her spleen. 
all wrapped up in dental floss, and her stomach was bursting at the seams with it, you know, just, just like her esophagus. Anyway. And we had our suspect, this Lucas guy, I started digging, looking for associates, placing, placing his spent time, things like that. And pretty soon, we find out that he, he did some of the off-the-books work uh, at a landscaping company. The guy, guy there tells us that he hadn't been to work in three days. We figured he quit. Well, pulled a few more threads. Nothing seemed to pan out. Looked like this guy killed Kelly, went off the grid. And then about a week and a half after we get the case, we put Lucas's picture everywhere. And if, if I'm not mistaken, the higher-ups told us all to tell everyone it was for a robbery. We started getting calls from different businesses saying Lucas had come in. Stopped for gas, got a burger at McDonald's, picked up a shampoo at the grocery store. All these menial tasks, probably 15 different things. Problem was, he apparently did all these things at locations that spanned the whole city, and he did them all at the same damn time. 10.48 a.m., something like that. All the security footage matched up. His credit card records matched up. All the purchases happened at the exact same time. And I'll be damned if it wasn't him at the locations. Not lookalikes. Him. Not a lot of the stuff I'm telling. It's weird. It's weird, yeah? When it all happened, that that's really all it was. It was just, it was just weird. Odd. It was never really all that scary. Some things were, some things were of course, but generally it was just stuff that boggled the mind. Now we watched these security tapes though, it's, it's hard to explain it. Me, Manth, and uh, anyone who was in the room at the time, we watched these tapes. Every time I think there was 11 places we had to watch the tapes. Every time he'd stand for a few seconds, Five, ten seconds. He would just stare at the camera, stone faced. It was like. It was like he was looking into my soul. I can only describe how it felt for me. I don't know for a fact that the others felt the same way. Uh, it felt like someone was squeezing their fist around my heart. And the breath left me. I started sweating. It was the worst. It was fear, pure terror. Two of the security guards had to leave the room. One started hyperventilating, another threw up. It only lasted as long as he was looking straight at the camera. When he looked away, everyone would breathe a sigh of relief. It was... Anyway. Manth, he came to me the last day of us going over the security cameras. He told me that he had something. The son of a bitch had gone over the pictures from the apartment. All the magazine letters. Found a pattern. There were certain letters that were written in a particular font. He put those through a cipher, or he call it a Caesarean shift. He moved the letters around, I don't remember how many, four or five times. It made a name, they kept repeating. It was the longest of long shots, but we, we started looking into Bruce Hiller. Now it turns out Bruce Hiller was another apartment over in a town near ours. We talked to the people there. They tell us he's the nicest guy in the world. I don't see him much, but whenever they do, he's polite. He's conversational. He's a really good guy. His apartment is um, it's immaculate. I mean, it looked like he went over the entire place with a Q-tip every day, every hour. The building itself was um, it, it was decent, um, kind of run down. It was it was his place. For what it was, it was spotless. We go through everything, and pretty soon it's time to go check the basement storage unit. And the way they set up was they were just partitioned off with little wooden wire doors. You'd see into everything. And Lucas's or Bruce's or whatever his damn name was. In his, it was packed floor to ceiling with stuff on either side of the door. But we could see through the door. There it was. Towards the back of the unit, with his back to us, reaching up under a shelf. You could barely see him, just kind of make out a silhouette. The only lights down here were a single bulb hanging from the ceiling with pull strings. Shine our lights in his unit, we pull out our weapons, we tell him to turn around slowly, keep his hands up. He doesn't move. He stands there, he reaches up on the shelf. 
He moved forward a bit. We keep telling him to turn around, show us his hands, blah, blah, blah. He doesn't move an inch. Building manager has a rapport with him, apparently. So we get him, and he tries pleading with him to turn around. Lucas just kept standing there with his arms up and his back to us. Manager unlocks the door. We get him out of there. Now, this was a year or two before tasers really started catching on, so we didn't, didn't have that option. We inch our way towards the guy. And as we get closer, it becomes clear that when I say he isn't moving, he isn't moving. He's, he's standing as still as a statue. Pretty soon we realize he's not breathing. And then we keep our weapons up. We keep our lights on him. And we keep yelling. You know, all that stuff. Did it by the book. When we got up to him, uh, we confirmed that he wasn't breathing when they called in the troops. When it was time to move the body, they, um, they had to tip him. It was rigor mortis that set in while he was reaching up to the shelf. It's on his face, though. He, um, it's the most anguished, terrified look I'd ever seen. I mean, picture yourself screaming at the top of your lungs. Think about what your face looks like when you do that. That was his face. We asked the people who lived above his storage unit if they'd heard anything, and of course they hadn't. When Man saw the guy, he did something to him. I mean, I mean, I saw Lucas's face. It scared the Christ out of me. No two ways about it. Gave me that same feeling as when we watched the security tapes. But Man, the guy never said another word ever. He never spoke to me, his wife, his kids. Never said another word, for as far as I know. Last I heard. He was living in an old folks' home. Poor son of a bitch just looks out the window all day. That was some years ago, though. I, I hope his, I hope for his sake he's dead. How terrible as that sounds. And they did an autopsy, and well, it was, it was something with his heart. I mean, it was blood pressure, um, something. But what it came down to was that he was literally scared to death. I didn't think it was real. They assured us that it was the only explanation. That was it. He died. I never found anything else um, on his connection to the girl. Why he had an alias. Why he had a second apartment. Nothing. Uh, we did find what the tip of his finger was touching. When he was reaching up on the shelf, though. It was a ball of uh, dental floss. Maybe the size of, um, I don't know. Uh, racket ball, you know, the one of those bouncy blue ones. Well, uh, I got a call a day or two later. And it told us inside that ball of dental floss was seven human teeth. As far as I know, none of them, none of them have ever been identified. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and thank you for watching today's video. And if you're on the podcast, then thank you for watching today's podcast. And if you're on uh, not the video or the podcast, then thank you for tuning into this telepathic broadcast. Oh, and there's something I need to mention to all of you. It's actually the big Halloween surprise. I mentioned this early on in the summer, but I never really got a chance to say what it was, because it wasn't really nailed down at the time. We, and by we, I mean me, Creeps McPasta, and Mew are going on tour across the United States in October. All the dates for it have been nailed down as of actually today, and tickets should be going on sale as of actually today. If you'd like to find out more, I'm going to have a bunch of information in the description down below all the way up until the tour is finished. But if you want to get a hold of your tickets, all the venues we've chosen have very limited seating, so make sure you get your tickets now if we're heading to a town near you. And one of the most exciting things about this is that I've been able to work with Mew across the United States doing conventions over the past couple of years. But this is the first time I think that Creeps McPasta is coming to the U.S., and it's especially the first time I'm going to be able to work with him live on stage. So this is going to be a show that's bigger than anything I've ever dreamed of being able to do in my entire YouTube career. So check it out down below at MarginWalkerPresents.com to get a hold of your tickets and come see us to celebrate Spooktober. Especially, I want to give a big thank you to my Patreon supporters. You guys over at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta are the best. Especially, Trace Miles, Talon Karlik, 
Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Wayne Milstead, Dr. Strawberry, Daniel Polson, Champinsky, Ken Lando Higuchi, Rev Miroku, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Nicholas Said El Yassin, Buddy Burroughs, Stephen Van Huss, Tristan Pelton, Goonington, G Weevil 3, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Asia, Gabrielle DeBaca, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, Titty Connoisseur, Melissa Swagart, Kudir Max, Jay Kerbine, Dante Rao, Last Blade Song, Chris Wrights, The Ginger Bros, Mads Beck, Lorenzen Post, Don Mulmeister, Eliminator86, Nebsky, Andrew Stenberg, Jason Silsma, Steampunk Center, and Rafael Rodriguez. If you guys would like to join them, you can head over to patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. And that's it for tonight. Sweet dreams, everyone. <laughs>